Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm not sure which time zone you're watching this from, but I have the honor to interview today Dr. Imran Rashid. He has knowledge from two sides of skills that are very important for the society right now. One of them is health. He's a qualified doctor. And the other side is digital. So he's also a tech entrepreneur and a digital health specialist. So my name is Fabio Pereira, and I'm here interviewing Dr. Imran about his new book that's coming up called Fillability. Dr. Imran, thank you so much for being here with us at the GoTo Book Club. Thanks for having me. Is there anything you want to introduce about yourself before we start talking about the book? Yeah, so uh, I'm also a father. <laughs> I think that's probably the main driver uh for me wanting to impact heavily on this um, topic uh, of how technology is affecting uh, both humans, but also the society we live in, because what I basically think we as grown-ups, adults, responsible humans should be doing is put, it, put a really uh, hard effort into making the planet and the environment, of course, the, the climate, etc., but also the mental climate that what we leave for our kids should be uh, so much better than the the current state we're in. So that's probably also another role I would say that is important for me that my kids, they grow up in a society in a world where, I mean, where tech is used for their benefit and not just for uh, exploitation, so to say. Cool. Yeah, it's good to see this view from the from a doctor, right? I guess that's one of the most amazing things about your work is that you see it from both sides. Uh, and I, I watched your TEDx talk, and I totally recommend watching uh, his TEDx talk. Uh, it's about the edge Thanks. of Texism, right? So in, the, in your talk, doctor, you mentioned about the fact that we have apps that actually create feelings or that they activate feelings and substances in our bodies like dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin. Yeah. Uh, what is the problem about that? Like, can you state a bit of the, the problem of why it is so so uh, important to talk about this and to resolve this issue right now. Yeah, so uh, one of the most important thing that I've discovered, not while I was studying to become a doctor, but af actually afterwards where I worked as a doctor and also as a tech entrepreneur and head of innovation in a private hospital, uh, as the creator of apps was the fact that you can actually design apps in specific ways that can change people's behavior, like create habits, like make them more uh, addictive, so to say. And um, I mean, whenever you go out and create addictive products, uh, it comes with a price. Uh, and, and what I started wondering was, of course, what is this price? What is it the kind of resource that we all are spending when we use our uh, addictive apps? Basically, that's the thing I started my, that was the thing that started my, this uh, curiosity because mental resources, your ability to focus, you pay attention. What I discovered at that time uh, in the beginning was that the problem with having emotionally driven behavior is that it basically undermines your free will. If something feels good, you don't think about it twice, right? We know that from tobacco industry. We know that from alcohol, from drugs, and from all other different kind of industries where emotionally driven or, you know, that when you go, go for the high or, or, or the kick you get or the fix, whatever you want to call it, that is something that can make you do stuff that you know is bad, but ultimately you end up doing it anyway. So the thing about tech being used in that context is that we need tech in our everyday lives. You can't live a modern life in a digital world today as we have um, without using tech. But this creates like an infrastructure where tech companies, they can walk in and march in basically into every classroom, every kid's room, completely unregulated with unlimited access to children's brains. And thereby they can start, you know, uh, exploiting them in, uh, on, of, uh, commercial purposes. So that was the thing I discovered could potentially be like a global problem because who is actually changing and controlling our kids' behavior? I mean, you, you and me as parents, we have difficulties with that, right? Um, but we didn't understand or realize that actually what we're up against is billion dollar companies that are actually opposing what we want for our kids. 
So I think that's probably what I think is um, the biggest issue that there are companies today that controls a large amount of our behavior and that behavior is against our own interest. Um, so that's basically, as I see the biggest issue. Yeah, it is definitely an issue. Uh, you've mentioned things like alcohol, tobacco, and uh, we do have regulation around those things, right? We won't, we wouldn't give like a bottle of whiskey to a, a child and also for adults, right? We have to control mechanisms for ourselves to make sure that we understand the impact of yeah. those things in, in our lives. Yeah. But for screens, for digital, there isn't. No. And yeah. So another uh, problem or aspect to that is that uh, if you get a kid, alcohol, tobacco, whatever, then that would impact them on a more like a, a standardized way. They would become intoxicated. But the problem with um, getting uh, your emotionally uh, developed uh, uh, content on your smartphone is that alcohol is not personalized. It's not your specific taste of alcohol. It's something you have to like, oh, oh it doesn't sound or it doesn't taste good. And then you probably won't get that addicted to it. But the problem with digital content is that it's personalized. It's something that suits you. And over time, it becomes more and more a, a, a customized for you as an individual, whereas the addiction starts uh, because there's obviously no downside to it when you start using it. It's fun. It's in interesting. If it's not fun, you just go for something that's more funny, right? So in that way, it becomes more and more and deeper and deeper ingrained into your brain, which makes it actually in some ways a bigger problem because it's there's a certain amount of how much alcohol or tobacco you can use. At some point, you'll get end up in the uh, emergency room, but there's no limits to how much you can like end up using your smartphone. Interesting. So you're talking about usage limits and understanding how much screen time we have. Uh, before we, we go into that, I have another question, which is the, the name of the book. It's quite catchy, oh, yeah. right? Feelability. How would you describe it? And what is this concept around the digital uh, concept that you're talking about? Yeah. So uh, again, with the problem is that you have to be aware of who is impacting on your emotions, like why do you use your phone? Is that because of emotionally stimulus? Is it because you're bored and you find something that's funny at your phone? I mean, is it that kind of behavior? Um, because if that's the problem and also the big issue, then what I think the world needs today is actually develop an ability to feel better. Basically, you need to learn how to feel better, but it's not something you can say, okay, now you should start feeling this or that. What I think we need is more a conscious way of understanding what is it that impacts my emotions and how do I create those people around me or the foundation for I, for, for healthy uh, emotions, so to say, right? Um, so what I discovered was that we don't really um, pay that much attention to uh, how we feel. We don't. We understand, okay, I'm not feeling well, then I go out and do stuff like that, but it's on a subconscious level. It's always reactive. If you don't feel well, um, let's say that you're bored, then you'll do something funny, right? If you're hungry, then you'll eat something. But sometimes these uh, reactive behavior patterns, they can be messed up. For instance, if, you, if you're if you bored or if you feel depressed, then you'll probably start eating fast food because it tastes good. So emotionally driven behavior can be connected to something that feels good, but that's also where the problem starts um, because then you'll develop an unhealthy lifestyle, which is not because you want to do that. It's because you might be stressed because of your work. So therefore the wiring between what we do and how we feel and what causes these emotions is something that's really messed up. And that's why I wanted to lay it out how your brain works, how your emotionally systems are controlling your behavior and why you need to develop a better ability to feel as a human being. So feelability is kind of uh, a new word that comes from the feel and ability. So it's yeah. the ability to feel amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great word. Thanks. I was, while you were talking about the concept of being aware and conscious of our feelings, it reminded me, I went to a spiritual retreat with Eckhart Tolle, the author of the book, The Power of Now. Yeah. And 
I'm also a, a follower of Buddhism and mindfulness. Do you see any connection between the ability to feel and understand our feelings and the concepts of being present in the moment and mindfulness yeah. and consciousness in, in, in general? Yeah, sure. Uh, so one of the things I've discovered, uh, which is in my research and all of that, is that one of the biggest problems at hand today is that we um, we get so occupied with our ourselves because everything that's on the phone is, you know, personalized information about you where you constantly are obsessed be with yourself. So it's like a systematic narcissism put into play. So you can constantly dive into how you feel and what makes you, uh, entertain, so to say. And, and what I've discovered is that a lot of the religions we have out there, the spiritual spirituality, like uh, meditation and a lot of the disciplines we are, have out there, what is it that actually make them effective? It's actually the, 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 the focus on these traditions and pra practical rituals, et cetera, is that we forget ourselves. So it's the opposite of being obsessed with yourself is the, is actually to learn how to forget yourself. So that's, um, as I see, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the moment where people, they feel, um, most satisfied with their lives is when they're doing something where they forget themselves, where the, what they do, who they do it for, and the, like the, the immersive uh, experience they get from being into uh, a flow state, so to say, the flow state we know from Mikhail uh, Chiksen Mihai, uh, who basically research into people, uh, being, you know, artists or sports or music or scientists who really focus on some uh, uh, something that they were doing that was bigger than themselves but uh, that was something that they really had to focus on um but where they also forgot themselves in the process where you dive so deep into something where you forget yourself that is what spirituality that is what religion that is what you know um meditation those kind of things are what i see a solution to a lot of the things that are going on today. So yeah, there are definitely some connections between uh, being obsessed with yourself and forgetting yourself. Interesting, the concept of forgetting about ourselves. And yeah, it has to do with the ego as well, right? Eckhart Tolle talks, talks a lot about the yeah. ego, which is like this, it's almost like the thing that's preventing us from being conscious is the, it's our ego. Yeah. Um, so you spoke about research. You said during my research, can you share with us a little bit of what your research has been about and what numbers you've discovered, like what facts you've discovered? Yeah. So, uh, for instance, I've, uh, you know, talked to more than 3000 uh, high school students uh, and uh, and uh, talked to them about their digital habits, uh, so to say. Uh, to find out, okay, so who's in control of your own life or who, I mean, who controls your, uh, I have this, uh, I have uh, different questions I asked them, but one question was that who controls your life the most, you or your phone basically, right? So out of that, with that question, out of the 3000 people, it's like 94% that says I do. So they do it themselves, right? And then the other questions I ask, then it's something like, okay, would you wish that you would cut down the use of your smartphone? Uh, are you consciously aware? Uh, um, uh, or do you think you use your phone subconsciously more than you think? Uh, do you lose track of time when you do that? And uh, uh, all of these questions indicates that they don't have control over what they do. But one uh, question that I ask them is that, how often do you experience vibrations from your pocket when you pick up your phone, there's nothing on it? 54% of 3,000 high school students experience that. That is something that I really find disturbing because it means that you actually don't need a phone to be disturbed by one. <laughs> I mean, your brain tells you to do stuff, right? And that is what I call... Um, uh, a biological uh, behavior change because you have done something in a such impulsive way in s for so long time that your brain basically starts to get these kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, um, withdrawal symptoms, so to say. If you're off your phone, then you get like a, a withdrawal symptoms that you need to get that kind of thing. And that's where I think 
um, you, it's fair to say that the phone and how you use it is very closely connected to other substance uh, misuses or abuses. Um, so that's one thing I've discovered. And I've also found that you can't put the, the, the control over your phone on individuals themselves. You can't say it's a matter of habits or a good behavior or oh, just put it away. You can't make it an individual problem. Because then it won't succeed. You won't succeed because how you feel is um, is uh, uh, highly connected to how other people treat you. And if you're not treated well by people around you, this is where you will try to get your emotions because it's social medias, right? So therefore, I think sense of belonging is one key message uh, in, in my book that you need to find uh, some more like uh, um, brain-friendly sources of emotions, like gratitude, like uh, like uh, nature, like uh, 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 doing uh, uh, good for other people. Like, I mean, those kind of sources of emotions are what you should be looking for instead of getting these artificial kicks from commercial companies that basically just wants to exploit your time, your energy and your uh, uh, focus, so to say. That's a great, so we're, we're diving into a bit of what we can do about it, right? Yeah. What things we can do about it and what, uh, what is your advice or your prescription on your TEDx? You say that in one of your consultations for the first time, you didn't prescribe something you said, uh, do something else about your behavior. It's almost like a behavioral prescription. It was. I'm a huge, yeah, I'm a huge uh, fan and specialist in behavioral economics as well. And we know that the problem is not knowing what to do. The problem is doing what we think is the best for us. So, and one of the theories that I love is the theory of nudge. That's why I wrote the book, Digital Nudge. Do you have any nudges, any recommendations of things that people should do? So for example, the classic nudge from Thaler is the one about if you want people to eat more fruit, leave the fruit like close to them. So the proximity, yeah. it's, it's a nudge. What nudges have you observed or prescribed to people for them to change their behavior for, for good? Yeah. Um, so uh, one obvious thing here is that uh, if you tell people to change their behavior and they say, yeah, okay, I'll do that, it, it'll fail. Because it's so much easier for people to acknowledge the need for change than actually doing it, as you're saying, right? So a nudge uh, that I've used also for people who want to start uh, stop smoking uh, has been like a make a two times two table uh, where they basically say, okay, what is the benefits from my current behavior and what are the uh, uh, drawbacks, right, from my current behavior? And then what are the uh, benefits from changing my, the new behavior and what are the drawbacks? Then you'll get like a two times two table where you have some, uh, some, some benefits and some drawbacks, right? The moment you do that, for instance, let's say that uh, spending too much time on your phone, what are the benefits from that? Okay, you get uh, educated and you, or you get access to information, you get uh, entertained. That's the benefits of spending time on your phone, right? Uh, you get a lot of likes, you get a lot of entertainment, it's fun, you get connections, etc. What are the drawbacks? That time you put into it is taken away from people in real life. For instance, your family, right? You can't both be a good social media addict and also be a good family father because time is just spent once, right? You can't both spend time on algorithms and content from there and, and, and uh, your kids wanting to get your, your attention, right? So that's like a clear distinction between this is what I do, what's good about it and what's bad about it. And then if you change uh, into what's good and bad about reducing screen time, so to say, that would be okay. I will not get access to, um, I'll bore myself to death maybe, or I'll, you know, uh, won't get access to news whenever I want it uh, and I fear of missing out could be one thing. What are the benefits of reducing your screen time? You can actually start controlling how you feel and what you spend your time on. When you put it that way, it's a no-brainer. I mean, basically the question is who should control what you feel? That is actually the question. In your life, 
you as a grown up, as an adult, as a, a conscious, a responsible human being who should actually control your emotions, your, uh, your connections, your, re- your relations, um, who should raise your kids. These companies spend more time with your kids than you do. <laughs> I mean, that, that is some of that when you put it that way, right? Um, I mean, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have a babysitter go and spend like five hours with your kid without knowing who is this person and what do they want from my kids, right? But still we do. We do that every single day, four or five hours a day. Our kids are being, uh, nursed by a nanny from, uh, I was, I was about to say a nanny from hell, but she's not from hell. She's either from Silicon Valley or from China. And they don't, so so those are some of the nudges. When you put it that way, it's clear to everyone that um, to become a good parent, you have to actively control who puts content inside the head of your, uh, your, your children. Yeah, you're right. So after the book has been published and uh, your talks, do you have any stories that people come back to you and tell you about how that has affected their lives? Yeah, so a lot of people has really, you know, been thankful to get uh, words out around talking about emotions. It's not some, I mean, the problem with emotions are that they're invisible. Uh, they're hard to describe. If I ask you, how are you feeling right now? You'll use your rational brain to try and more or less, you know, put names on what you're feeling. But it's the emotions are like, as I also describe it in the book, uh, emotions are more like fishes in the water. They're like seamless uh, and, and uh, invisible and they move fast. Whereas thoughts are more like birds, noisy and, uh, you know, visible, etc. And you can't solve fish problems with bird logic. That is the difference between asking people how they feel and actually understanding how they feel. Because empathy is something that you sense. It's not something you, you, um, I mean, empathy is my ability to d- detect your emotions and respond to that. If you're crying, it's not like I, Oh, what does this mean when a man is uh, pouring water out of his eyes? Well, it's me responding to your emotions. That is the special thing about humans. And that's also the thing that is cut over or changed fundamentally by digital, because I can't, detect your emotions in the same way. Basically one problem here is that we can't have eye contact through, I mean, I'm, if I'm watching the camera, I'm not watching your eyes. Right. And that is, again, you'll get the sense that he's looking at me. I'm not because I'm looking into a camera. Yeah. Just the eye contact. Now that you mentioned, I, once I thought that the, the technology company should put a camera right in the middle of the screen, because then you would be looking at, literally the person's eyes but, but they no have ac- they they have actually i saw a, a recently uh that's like a, a company that has fixed the problem where they basically uh with ai changes the direction of the eye i mean uh, with ai yeah yeah with ai they're ai <laughs> i think yeah so yeah a lot of things are going on but the problem is that we i think the main problem that i'm trying to talk about in this book is that the more technology we bring into the society the more humane we have to fight to be, become. Cool. And is there any personal anecdotes or stories from, from you that you would like to, to tell us that kind of yeah. talk about the, the concept of the book? Yeah. So, I mean, being uh, this digital savvy doctor who's been like, you know, focusing on this for a decade or so, tech entrepreneur and been to Silicon Valley several times, et cetera. Uh, my kids, uh, especially my daughter, she's 14 years old, uh, old now. She was brought up with unlimited access to technology, right? Because I thought that was the good thing to do at that time. And recently, um, this also led her to become stressed. Uh, she had difficulty concentration, etc. cetera. Um, so recently, I sent her to this um, uh, boarding school where they uh, uh, stay on the school. Um, and the first 10 days, they're without their phones. Basically, the school did take away the the phones and let them to be, you know, just uh, stay together in this uh, uh, real life social media that the school become, right? Um, And 
Yesterday, I talked to her. After the first, I think first time in her life, 10 days without her smartphone since she's gotten the smartphone five years ago. And you know what she told me? Um, uh, she said, Dad, now I understand what it is that you're talking about. You don't understand how good it felt to stay uh, without your, to be without your phone. And that response really uh, hit me in the, in, in, in the heart because you can't explain this to people. You have to create the surroundings where you basically change the structure around people in order for them to start feeling. So the ability to feel heavily uh, is impacted by who you're with, who's around you, that they're also paying attention to you, that they're in a physical sense, uh, that, that the sense of belonging is created. Um, so, so there are a big need for structural changes. There are a big need for cultural changes in order for us to become human again. So that's, I think, probably the strongest uh, indicator of uh, the, the messages in my book. Yeah, you mentioned something which I usually say that there is no way to learn how to swim without water. Only Sheldon from that, that TV show, The Big Bang Theory, he said he learned how to swim on the Internet. Yeah. So you have to go through an experience in order to feel what it's like. And then it's the, that wake up moment of just like what you mentioned that she said, like, now I understand. And now I can feel it. Yeah. And now I can, feel, I it. Yeah, now now I can, I can feel, feel it. it. Yeah. But I think actually uh, what you can do on the internet, you can actually drown. I think we can drown. You drown in information overload. You drown in, um, in the artificial, uh, emotionally, um, emotionally, uh, evoking content that is commercial. Um, so I think that leaves us with, um, uh, something that's not good for us. Therefore, uh, I also know that you are, um, also very, uh, focused on this, uh, infobesity concept that I really love because basically, and it's fun that living differently uh, in different parts of the world, we've reached some of the same conclusions that, um, the kind of, uh, you just like you talk about what you eat. If you eat healthy, you become healthy, right? If you eat unhealthy, like burgers, etc., fast food, then you become unhealthy. The same goes for the kind of information, the mental food you, uh, consume, right? Uh, where I, completely agree with you on your uh, concept of on infobesity, but also on the concept of mental fast food. High calories feel good. It's not good for you if other people are feeding you. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the infobesity because I was going to really ask you the question. And yeah, I, I'm finishing up my post-grad specialization right now exactly on something which is called tech addiction. Okay. And I don't like to word the word addiction, because I think it's more a compulsion, because in the infobesity studies that I do, I feel like uh, technology is more, it's better to be connected or compared to food. And yeah. why do I say that? Because if we compare it with, let's say, a drug like cocaine, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's say, then the treatment is to stay fully away from it yeah. and to stop completely. Whereas with technology, the treatment is about how to have a healthy relationship with technology. So if, if I were to ask you as a doctor, yeah, we should be comparing technology with sugar or cocaine, which one would be the, the closest? Uh, of course, uh, sugar, uh, because sugar is necessary for our body. We need it, but we can also easily become more or less addicted to it or eat too much of it. And we know that is also one of the biggest issues today, right? Everyone knows that they should eat healthy at the same time as we know that today uh, there are more people dying from eating too much than too little. So, you know, I think that says something about humans. Uh, too much of something can be a problem. And what I also want to like put it a little bit more nuances here uh, towards the end is that what I think is important, uh, the reason to why we go on social media and use that is basically something that is hardwired into humans. Why do we survive as humans? We do that because other people from second one takes care of us. So our brains 
are basically hardwired for connections with other people. And that's why we want to use our uh, smartphones to connect with other people, especially the kind of apps that connects us to others, right? The problem is that um, the kind of sociality or the kind of social experience we get from our smartphones is not something that our brain senses in the same way that we're supposed to. Um, what we do is go on our smartphones, press on our glass screens to see what other people's touches on their glass screen has done with my glass screen. So it gets into our analytical, rational uh, be- part of our brain, and thereby we try to get emotions out of it. It's like trying to kiss someone with a mask on. It's not the same. It's like trying to water a plant with a picture of water. So we're using uh, some indirect measures to, it's a real need. We need other humans, but we need them in real life because that's the full body experience. And the more we try to, you know, the, the, and, and it's a evil, um, uh, uh, like a evil uh, spiral because uh, the more you lack the real connection with other people, the more you'll try to fill your void by using this artificial uh, uh, connection uh, and the bigger the problem would become. You haven't in today, I also saw a, a statistic um, of um, we haven't had more uh, loneliness among young people today at the same time as we haven't had better uh, possibilities or opportunities to connect with others. And what is the reason, uh, or basically what is the solution for all that? And that's uh, the, the, the U.S. Uh, general surgeon. He recently came up with this big report about uh, uh, recommendations for social media uses. And I think they really hit the, the, the nail on the head where they say that there are some recommendations. We know that if you use social media more than three hours a day, you double your risk of uh, anxiety and depression. So what the golden rule here should be for everyone who spends time online to become, you know, socially fulfilled, etc. You should put a maximum of one hour on social media usage. Use to carefully look at who are, uh, I mean, what kind of platforms am I uh, using? And more importantly, you should also only follow people, you know, in real life, if you want to get your sociality uh, I mean, if you want to get the real benefits from using social media, make sure you don't spend too much time and make sure that it's quality connections that you are following. For instance, if you follow everyone, it's also people who makes you feel less, like, you know, the popular uh, girl from the school uh, uh, who makes you feel ugly, then that is basically emotionally self-harming. So therefore, there's a lot of things around being conscious about what um, surroundings that are feeding your emotions. I think that's some of the, the, the takeaways uh, I have uh, for uh, the direction the world is moving into. We need to develop some consciousness around how we feel and what makes us feel that and control that a lot better than we do today. Well, I guess this is a great way to wrap it up with this one hour golden rule, right? And yeah. um, is there any any last things you want to say, doctor? Yeah, I, th- I think just take care of yourself and the best way to take care of yourself, I think for everyone is that uh, make a small exercise, which is close your eyes for like 20 seconds. Think about what matters the most for you, right? Um, if you just, you can do that. Let's close our eyes and think about what matters the most for us for like 10 seconds. Just close your eyes, focus on what matters the most for us. And now open your eyes. I bet that you thought about people, family, kids, people close to you, right? Why? Because they mean a lot to you. You mean a lot to them, they mean a lot to you. You have close relations to them, right? Which means that when you close your eyes, you know what's important in your life. You know what matters. How come we then 
spend more time looking on our phones, touching them, thinking about them than we do with the people who matter us the most in our lives. I think that's one of the most um, easy way to see if you're off track in your life, focusing on things that are visible, that gets your attention, or if you're really paying attention to those who deserve it. Yeah. Wow. That's a, yeah, it is definitely 10 seconds that make us realize that I'm sure if you ask 3000 people that question, they won't think about their phones when they close their eyes. They won't. They won't. All right. Thank you, Dr. Imran. It was a huge pleasure to have you on the GoTo Book Club and success on this book and the talks and let's make the world a better place. Especially starting by ourselves. Thanks. Thank you so much. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code BOOKCLUB. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more. 